Now it's your turn. Your opportunity to call in and sound off about the local and national issues that have everyone talking. Northwest Florida's Talk Radio, 1330 WEBY, FM 991. Opinions of the Your Turn hosts are their own and don't necessarily reflect those of the station. Here's Renee Giacchino. Good afternoon. You're listening to Your Turn, the program that I've dubbed meaning nonsense with common sense. To learn more about my organization, the Center for Individual Freedom, you can find us on the web at cfif.org. Well, joining me now is one of my favorite authors and guests. That is Andrew Oak. Andrew Oak is an award-winning television producer who's traveled the world in search of provocative stories and adventures. He is the author of volumes one and two of the books Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. And in fact, he is the First Ladies Man. You can find him on the web at firstladiesman.com where you can also order his books. Andrew, welcome back to your turn. Renee, it's so wonderful to be with you again. It's a pleasure to have you back, as always. It's been far too long, and but hopefully I've given you enough time to work on Volume 3. <laughs> well, the great thing about being the first ladies man is that every four to eight years we get another first lady and there's still so much to find out about all the ones we've already had that it's an endless uh, source of interest for me, an endless, endless source of information and, and really just learning so much more about these women who for a long time have not gotten their due for being the most powerful, unelected and unpaid women in the world. It's just a truly remarkable subject, and I, I love it more every day. Well, I've got another idea, something I think, you know, as we get ready to celebrate one of my favorite holidays, and that is Mother's Day. And, um, you know, I will send loving prayers to my mother who is no longer with us, but I will celebrate with at least two of my three children. One of them is is not in the area right now, but um, I will be in Texas visiting two of mine. I've got an idea for you. How about writing about the other unsung hero, women in the lives of the presidents, and that is their mothers? Well, you know, that's a great topic, and mothers have been such a big play, or mother-in-laws or mothers of these first ladies, the mother-in-laws of the president, that it truly is. And these family members, and I know you know from, from my books, and I know at least one of your daughters is a fan of my books as well, so please give my best to your family when you're in Texas, the home of many of our first ladies and a lot of my travels, logged a lot of miles. And my late mother was actually born in River Oaks, Houston, Texas, and mm. I dedicate these books and all of my research to her memory, as she never did get to see any of this, but boy, she would have been a fan of this work. This would have made her very, very proud, and she was a special great lady, and where I get a lot of, of, of my sense of how important women are in your lives and mothers and things like that as we come up on Mother's Day. So I think that's, I think that's a great idea to include in further research. So let's talk about uh, America's first ladies as mothers. Let me start with um, some trivia questions. Who had the most children? The most children of any first lady or hostess was Thomas Jefferson's oldest daughter, Martha Patsy Jefferson Randolph, who also was the first first lady to have a baby in the White House named after James Monroe, uh, um, uh, I believe. James Monroe or Madison. I'm almost positive it was, it was Monroe. Now that I'm going back to James Madison. But she had, I believe, 13 children on her own, but the president who had the most children was President John Tyler, but he had it with two different wives, as his wife, Letitia Tyler, was the first first lady of now hopefully only three to die in the White House uh, during her term as first lady. And when you say die in the White House, physically? Physically, she did, yes. When And, and that was a strange period of time, because you remember that John Tyler was the first vice president to be promoted to president as William Henry Harrison died 30-some days in office after catching pneumonia after giving one of the longest uh, uh, inaugural speeches in history. He was also the oldest first president, first, the oldest president until Ronald Reagan got into office. But Letitia Tyler was of very poor health when they lived in Williamsburg as the vice president and second lady. And when he first came to Washington, D.C., 
He just brought some of his daughters and sons with him. His wife didn't make the journey, but when she was well enough to make the journey from Williamsburg to uh, Washington, D.C., where Tyler had become the promoted president from vice president, she would physically die in, in the White House, as, as two other first ladies after her would do as well. Which were whom? The next first lady to die in the White House was Caroline Harrison, wife of Benjamin Harrison, and she had, I believe, a kidney disease. Uh, they did take her out of the White House for a little bit to try and get her some fresh air and clean water in some of the surrounding mountain areas and things like that, but that didn't work out, and she was brought back. And then the uh, the third and hopefully, again, final first lady to die in the White House was Wilson's first wife, Ellen Wilson, who died in the early 19 teens, so 19, I believe, 13 or 14 is when she died. She also died of a kidney disease, Bright's mm-hmm. disease, which also killed Theodore Roosevelt's uh, first wife, Alice, with whom he had his first um, daughter and child, Alice, also named Alice. But I think I think Bright's disease was, was back in the day uh, just a way of just uh, uh, what they called kidney failure uh, of, of any kind because uh, of, of many people seem to have that in common, primarily women. I think it may have surrounded um, some, some pregnancy difficulties. So we talked about um, which first lady or hostess had the most children, Thomas Jefferson's daughter with 13, including, and that was one of my follow-up questions, any born in the White House. Any other um, babies born while um, first lady was in the White House? Yeah, you know, and this is this is one of the first uh, senses of, it's interesting, when the, when the project, when the C-SPAN series that I produced, uh, uh, First Lady's Influence and Image, along with a great team at C-SPAN, their idea, they brought me in as a contractor, just a wonderful place to be, and I was very fortunate to be a part of this project and log all these miles out on the road, which made me the First Lady's man. But I came across uh, uh, that the, these women were also mothers and often... And the first uh, to come to a real issue of this being in the White House and giving birth to the was Francis Cleveland. And Francis Cleveland is the we're we're, loose, we're losing lady. you a little bit. Oh, there you go. You're back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He was. She was. She was 21 when she married Grover Cleveland at 49. Imagine that happening today. But um, she gave birth to a couple children while she was in the White House, and it caused quite a stir and security concerns because people wanted access to these children. They would come up to them on the White House lawn and pick them up out of there, away from their nannies to get pictures taken with them or, or tear pieces of cloth from their, from their carriages and stuff. And the Clevelands had to move, physically move out of the White House during the, the non-social season to, to provide what they thought was safety for their children. So does at the age of 21, Frances Cleveland, um, does that make her the youngest mother uh, in the White House? Uh, yes, she, she's the youngest first lady at, when she married Grover Cleveland at, um, at, at the age. She was 21 and he was, he was uh, uh, 49. She's also the only first lady to get married in the White House. There's a number of other presidents that because of their wives die or because they they. Uh, well, Grover Cleveland and, and, and James Buchanan are the only bachelor presidents, and Grover Cleveland the only bachelor president to marry. But um, uh, Frances Cleveland has the distinction of also being the only first lady to get married in the White House in the Blue Room. Um, uh, beautiful, beautiful, small ceremony. And then they honeymooned off in uh, Deer Park, Maryland, outside of Up, we are... some of the structures and homes are still there from from when they honeymooned. Oh, that's interesting. Who, um, what about the oldest mother? The oldest mother, the oldest woman to become mother, you mean? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, uh, it's a tough question to answer, so you answer it any way you want. Yeah, well, I'll I'll tell you, there there was a first lady that that, that had children, uh, a a lot of children, and, and well into some of her older years, Lucy Hayes. And Lucy Hayes is one of my one of my favorites, having so many children. Um, uh, uh, she was. It's funny because I, I think of another first lady after her, and and this woman I'm about to mention could not have been the great first lady that she was unless Lucy Hayes 
had done what she did. Lucy Hayes did so many things uncharacteristic and untypical, atypical of women in her day. She was at these winter encampments with her husband, similar to Martha Washington in the uh, in, in the Revolutionary War. But she actually worked on uh, in hospitals and lent her helping hand to mend uniforms and do things in the field, even though she was a woman of stature being married to a general. And then when her husband, after the Civil War, would become governor, she would go out into the mental institutions, the veterans' hospitals, the orphanages, and come back and report as almost this sort of uh, 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 recon, boots-on-the-ground type of role for her husband, going to places where women typically didn't go, go typically also women of privilege. And she had a lot of children. I think she had eight uh, children herself that, that, that lived into adulthood, and they still have a lot of ancestors and relatives of the Hayes's, a lot of Rutherford B- Hayes's named after their ancestor running around. But, but it also makes me think of Eleanor Roosevelt, who had a lot of children with FDR right up until the point before he entered the White House. Um, and she was, she was an older lady when they entered the White House. So those are two that come to mind with a, with a, lot, of, um, a lot of children. All right, we are going to have to take a quick break. We are talking with Andrew Oak. He is the First Ladies Man. You can find his website at firstladiesman.com. We are talking about mothers in the White House. That is the First Ladies as mothers in celebration and anticipation of Mother's Day weekend just coming up. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got more questions for Andrew Oak, our guest. If you've got a question for him, please give us a call at 850-623-1330. We'll be right back after this short break. Please stay tuned. It's your turn to join the conversation at 623-1330. Talk Radio 1330 WEBY FM 99.1. We are back. My name is Renee Giacchino. I'm corporate counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom, and I'm hosting this version of Your Turn, the program that I've dubbed Meeting Nonsense with Common Sense. And we are continuing our conversation with Andrew Oak. Andrew is the First Ladies Man. You can find his website at firstladiesman.com. That's where you can also tap in to his books, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volumes 1 and 2. I highly recommend both of them. Andrew, we're talking about the first ladies as mothers. Um, who had the fewest number of children or none? Yeah, there's a couple that have none. Actually, we were talking uh, uh, earlier in the first break about um, Ellen Wilson, Wilson's first wife. Wilson's second wife had no children. Edith Wilson and President Wilson had no children. She was an older lady by the time they got married. And the Polks also had no children. Sarah and James K. Polk had no children. And this was an interesting story for after the White House. And he's the, he was the, the, one of the quickest presidents to die after the White House. Him and LBJ both uh, unfortunately passed away very soon after their presidency. And both Lady Bird Johnson and Sarah Polk are two of our longest living first lady widows. Sarah Polk lived 40 some years after uh, the death of her husband and became quite a quite a grand dame of 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 uh, first ladies down there living in uh, outside of um, Nashville, Tennessee, where Polk Place had been built. And a lot of people, including during the Civil War, both Union and Confederate generals and officers would come to talk to her and discuss and and get her opinions and and uh, and, and advice throughout the war. So even though they didn't have uh, children, their their legacies lived on in in different ways. And it's interesting to to, to think about those women in in that uh, perspective. So you you referenced um, very early in our discussion, you know, the the significant influence. Uh, that the first ladies have, you know, they are unpaid offices, some, you know, maybe not even, you know, privately hoping that their husband might not win the office of president. Yes. Um, yes. Like it or not, you know, they become the first lady, they're in the spotlight. And, and even as mothers, difficult things happen or soon to be mothers in their lives. Um, on a sad note, how many lost children while they were in the White House? Yeah, there are, and that that is a very you know the one the one that comes to mind is the, is the is the most recent one, which luckily was not um, uh, 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 failures. It was in the twenties when when Grace Coolidge lost their son Calvin Jr., uh, which who was their youngest son. Um, and it, it's it's an interesting story that he 
He died because of a staph infection that he got from a blister when he was playing tennis at the White House. He was at Mercersburg University in Pennsylvania, and he came to visit his parents during spring break. And at the Coolidge Library, they have letters that were back and forth. And Grace didn't like her handwriting, so she, she typed all her letters and then would sign her name. But she was writing back and forth to her son, Calvin Jr., and he was complaining about needing new socks. And he was going to come to town, and it kind of it just really humanized the fact, like, that, you know, you'd come home in college from college and you'd do your laundry at your parents' place and you stock up on food and you go shopping with your parents say, I need socks and underwear and T-shirt or new jeans. You know, you get as much as you can while you're home. And these kids were doing the same. It's just that they were visiting their parents in the White House. But the interesting thing was in a little addendum, a P.S. that was written up the side of this last letter that Calvin Jr. had with his mother, he said, P.S., I need new socks. And the fact that he was playing tennis without socks at the White House where he got a blister or the staph infection, they hadn't even realized this in looking at their collection because it's so vast and it's almost you can't see the forest for the trees. But I said to them, if I were Grace Coolidge and my son got a blister playing tennis without socks and I look back and would reread, no doubt, that last letter, that last correspondence you had with him over and over again to see socks referenced in that, it was almost haunting and, and, and ghostly for that element to, to be there. And, and everyone's eyes in the Coolidge library just got wide, and they thought, we, we'd never even considered that. It just shows you how a, a fresh eye on collections and things, all the things that we discovered together during the filming for the, for the C-SPAN series. So what about um, uh, unborn children, you know, pregnant mothers in the White House? Uh, uh, but in, in, in what sense? I'm sorry. Did, did, I, I did any of them lose the their children? Any, but, any loose children, you know, miscarriages? Oh, for sure. And, you, you're like, they're still born in miscarriages and right. things like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, there, there were, there were plenty. Um, um, even as recently as Bess Truman, uh, first lady, uh, Bess Truman in the forties, they only had one child together, Harry S. Truman and Bess Truman, and it was Margaret, and it was the pride and joy because she had had numerous uh, 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 miscarriages and had a lot of trouble getting married. Now, she wasn't first lady at the time. Their their child was was uh, uh, full grown and an adult by the time they got in there. But um, I, I I I don't know if I'm misspeaking to say that Jacqueline Kennedy had a miscarriage at some point as well. Uh, not as first lady. I think um, uh, even from number one, uh, uh, Martha Washington, uh, though she did not have any children with President Washington, she had four children with her first husband, Daniel Park Custis, and two of those were lost before they were, were uh, uh, two or, or, or even three years old. Um, one, I think, was, was, was stillborn even, or, or, or under a year old. But the most tragic of, of child loss is you, can, you can bring to Jane Pierce. Jane Pierce and Franklin Pierce had three children together, all boys. One died very young, as you would expect, and then the next, the oldest boy, died of, of, of basically dehydration after a, an illness, something that you would think today, I mean, all you would do is give the kid an IV and he would survive, and to think that they could lose children like that. So she was left with one child, the middle child, named Benny, uh, Benjamin, in short, they called him Benny. And Benny was, was killed in a train accident right in front of the president-elect and soon-to-be first lady, Jane Pierce, as they were taking a train from Andover, Massachusetts, back to their Concord home to pack up and move into the White House. So she was planning an inauguration for her husband, and her last remaining of three children was killed tragically and gruesomely right before her eyes in a, in a horrible train accident just less than a mile outside of Andover, Massachusetts. Truly, truly tragic. And it, it tainted the, the entire presidency. Uh, it, it, Franklin Pierce became an alcoholic because of it. Jane Pierce uh, uh, blamed God's vengeance on, on Franklin Pierce for, for staying in politics when he had told his wife he was going to get out. Just a horrible, horrible situation. And the, the letters and the notes and things that surrounded her just, just tear your heart out. Just, just, just tragic. Well, that that is a very tragic tragic story. Let's finish on a on a positive note, if we may. Yeah. Um, Andrew, tell us what's next for you. 
Well, you know, uh, the, the C-SPAN project was, was fantastic, and it, it, it took me to travel fast and wide. But what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to fill in the missing pieces. There are places that I couldn't get to because of time constraints or budget constraints. We didn't have all the time and all the money in the world to do this. So now I can, and I have been, and I will be making extensions and additions to chapters. I've since gone back to the birthplace of Lucy Hayes in Chillicothe, Ohio, and found a wonderful, wonderful little home there where she was born. I've gone back to the birthplace of Dolly Madison outside of Greensboro, North Carolina, and the Historical Society there has a wonderful collection. I'm looking into research that links uh, that linked uh, Kath, um, uh, Louisa Catherine Adams, the first foreign-born first lady, born in uh, London, England in 1775, never stepping foot in the country until she was the, the wife of soon-to-be President John Quincy Adams. So uh, linking her to... Uh, the um, uh, President Zachary Taylor's wife, Margaret Taylor, who was born in and around Waldorf, Maryland, and Louisa Catherine Adams' uh, uh, uncles uh, and aunts were uh, colonists at the time living in Maryland. So there's still a lot to uncover. And then we think about it, the Obamas don't have their museum yet. And when that opens in 2020, I'm going to have to dive into that with both feet. And and then the, the Trumps after that. So there's still so much to uncover uh, about some of these first ladies, a lot of them uh, uh, lesser known. I know that uh, Anna Harrison, who never stepped foot in the uh, nation's capital in Washington, there's still so much to do in research there with family members and ancestors uh, and birthplaces in North Bend, Ohio, and Vincenzi's, Indiana, where they had their, um, their Grouseland estate which I didn't get a chance to go to, and because she never was in Washington or really became a first lady, having been her, her husband only in office for, for 30 days or so, uh, there's, there's, there's just still so much to find out that's so exciting. Well, we will be um, sitting on the edge of our seats. I know at least I will, and my daughter Haley as well, waiting for the next edition or uh, appendix extension to the existing volumes one and two unusual for their time on the road with america's first ladies we've been talking to the first ladies man andrew oak andrew thanks again uh we appreciate it very much we appreciate you joining us uh just before mother's day to talk about the mothers in the white house as our first ladies always a pleasure renee and happy mother's day to you as well thank you so much